What's going on everybody, Mortem here, this time bringing you a video on CRPGs for beginners, which is a question that I field pretty regularly in my comments as much of this channel is dedicated to that particular genre. And with the release of Baldur's Gate 3 only a few months away, along with things like Warhammer 40k Rogue Trader also in the works without a set release window, alongside further just general interest, it seems like it was time to revisit this subject, as I had done a video on this more than a year ago, which was a little more basic than this one is intending to be. As more than just CRPGs for beginners in general, I'd like to point out some common places to start for more indie-oriented CRPGs, as well as games to play if you already have a little bit of knowledge on the subject but are still pretty new to it, etc, etc. Though, first and foremost, towards the beginning of the video here, I do want to mention that these are ultimately just suggestions. If I have learned anything from reviewing the massive amount of these that I have, which for the record I have reviews of all of these individual games if you want more information, but I would say the primary thing that I've learned is simply that there is no right way to approach this. While I will obviously be giving you suggestions, my most important piece of advice that I could actually give you is simply pick the one that looks the most interesting to you. Because many CRPGs, by their very nature, which we're about to get into, tend to be very system heavy and require a certain learning curve, especially before you get used to them, and the best way to get past that really is simply by playing a game that you are genuinely invested in, which means the best place to start is simply wherever you want to start the most. From there, I want to talk a little bit about what a CRPG is and even means, and then we'll get into the recommendations. So, what a CRPG is is actually up for quite a bit of debate, and this is mainly due to the passage of time and the emergence of subgenres. However, taken quite literally, CRPG RPG at one point just meant computer role-playing game. However, that's not really the case anymore. These days, it generally means classic RPG, and in particular tends to refer to isometric RPGs. And while there are, I would say, several third-person CRPGs, 9 out of 10 when somebody is using this phrase or acronym, what they're referring to is older isometric RPGs. More often than not, these games rely on tabletop adaptations or a significant amount of rules and mechanics being implemented directly into a game, as opposed to, say, more action-oriented adventures that we see these days, which go relatively light on the actual RPG elements, which is why you don't really see people referring to something like Skyrim as a CRPG, as the actual RPG part of that is light in comparison, at least on a mechanical level. Obviously, you can roleplay yourself however you want. But I tell you this basically just to mention that there's a lot of gray area as to what a CRPG even means, and I wouldn't get too bogged down in what specific acronym anyone is using, as there is plenty of disagreement on the specifics. So with all of that out of the way, let's dive a little further and get to the games that I would actually recommend to anyone. When people ask me this question, these are the two games that I would typically recommend to them because they are modern games, which means you can run them on just about anything thing these days without having to put any work into that, and many of the systems in general are a bit more modern, which makes them easier to get into if you're not used to playing games from 10 plus years ago, more than 20 in some cases. But first up, we have Divinity Original Sin 2. Chances are you've at least heard of this one before, and that is for good reason. It is a fantastic RPG that leans very heavily into character building, as well as sort of picking your own way through. As any scenario you're presented with has tons of options, even if you don't necessarily realize they're even there. And this is done by allowing you to interact with and move most objects in the environment, provided you have the ability to do so, alongside a wealth of character building, dialogue options, reactivity to player choices. It's honestly a bit immense in those things. And you combine that with the very interesting world of the Divinity series, which I have covered very thoroughly on the channel, and naturally you have quite a winner, which is of course why this game is so highly praised and why Larian was ultimately given the Baldur's Gate 3 license, which will likely also be a great place to start for people when it launches. But Divinity Original Sin 2 uses its own 
system, meaning you don't have to go read about it anywhere, though you can certainly find guides for it, as well as some best practices, though in general it's not a particularly complicated system with much of it boiling down to your points in various skills, either combat, civil, etc., producing some tangible effect on your own abilities. However, the system provides enough of a learning curve that figuring out the ins and outs of it, as well as what is available to you out in the world, can be a lot of fun while still providing you a wealth of options to move through the world with. So because of this, Original Sin 2 is always high on the list for a good place to start. However, it still has its downsides. The biggest one you'll see is the armor system. Each character has magic and physical armor, and in order to inflict status effects on the enemy, you have to get rid of the relevant armor status first. And later in the game, when these numbers get pretty inflated, you're likely to sort of build your entire party around getting through one of these types of armor, and that's a very common criticism that you'll see. The other game that's a very easy recommend is Wasteland 3. The slightly older sibling to Fallout, believe it or not, the original Wasteland did actually predate the original Fallout. However, Wasteland 3 has kept it isometric as opposed to the more 3D, let's say, adventures of games in the Fallout franchise these days. And much like modern Fallouts, to be honest, Wasteland 3 is a sort of zany post-apocalyptic adventure that has its roots in a slightly more serious, gritty post-apocalypse. And if you prefer a grittier tone, you might want to check out Wasteland 2, which is also an isometric CRPG, but Wasteland 3 is generally regarded as a fantastic place to start, and this is because there are a fantastic amount of ways to build your character as well as interact with the Colorado Wasteland. As we take up the roles of the Desert Rangers, sent to Colorado from Arizona to try to entreaty the Patriarch for help by tracking down his wayward children who are causing problems. This will lead you to all sorts of politics between the various factions of the Colorado Wasteland, which gives you a ton of options to maneuver your way through these. Each area has a variety of endings, and in the overworld, the sort of big map, if you will, lets you drive the Kodiak around, which is a customizable vehicle that is usable in some combat encounters, and along with some really memorable characters. Wasteland 3 is a fantastic RPG, and if you're looking for a sort of light way to get into this genre with a relative recent game, Wasteland 3 is your best bet. And those are the two games that I generally recommend to most people. But from there, we still have a variety of other options. Which brings us to the next section of this video, which are games that are better if you have some familiarity with tabletop RPGs, or you've just played a lot of RPGs in general. That is to say, you have some experience with either the genre or the systems that they are typically based on. And in either of those cases, you'll like get a pretty good experience out of these games. First up on this list, we have Celasta, Crown of the Magister. If you are familiar with Dungeons & Dragons 5e, Celasta is for you, as it is an attempt to bring a very rules-as-written interpretation of 5e into the digital space. It's also still being updated with the newest DLC for this launching in about a month from the time of this video, which will bring even more content for you. But much of what Celasta does is bring 5e into the video game space. There's also co-op, so you can play this with your friends. With the downsides here being that graphically, for a modern game, this one looks a little rough, to be sure. And a lot of the main campaigns here are much less RPG than you might expect from a CRPG. In particular, the actual main campaign, Crown of the Magister. Though, a separate campaign that was launched later, known as the Lost Valley, as well as the upcoming DLC, Palace of Ice, which is a new campaign, tries to address address that a bit by being more of a choice-focused playthrough. However, probably the biggest thing to know about Celasta is that it has a custom editor in it, meaning that you can create your own adventures or download them from other people and play those. And combined with the pretty faithful interpretation of D&D 5e, it's a great way to play that system in a video game, potentially even with friends. But then we have all of the Obsidian CRPGs, which is Pillars 1 and 2 and Tyranny. Pillars 1 and 2 are great games and are honestly larger games you've probably also heard of, especially seeing as a game they are working on currently known as Avowed will be set in this world known as Aeora. And if you're interested in learning more about this, I've also done a huge lore series for Pillars of 
Eternity as well. However, Pillars of Eternity 1 and 2 use their own system, a system that was worked on by Josh Sawyer, and I don't know if they've ever actually published it, but they were working on like full tabletop rules for this at one point. I'd be lying if I said I kept up with the actual publication of that, but while it's not going to be based on any system that is present elsewhere, it's a game you will get a lot more out of if you understand how a lot of tabletop systems work, especially the first game. The first game has a lot of classes and things, but unfortunately doesn't really give you any way of knowing what you're going to get when you level up, what happens when, etc., which means you're going to have to figure a lot of that out on your own, which is where the previous knowledge of a lot of these systems and how they work in these games can help you out. But it's definitely a game where you're probably going to have to spend some time with it to really understand what is going on and then actually get good at it. However, if you're willing to do that, there's a wonderful narrative in a fantastically well-built world under here, which can all provide a pretty great experience. Now, the first title is very heavy on the text, which is slightly less true of the second game, but the first game in particular has tons of text, which isn't everybody's cup of tea, personally not something I care about, but do know that going into it, there's a lot of reading involved and a lot of telling you rather than showing you. The second game, on the other hand, sort of overcorrected some of these issues where the first game went a little long, the second one is very short, main story-wise, with most of the content actually being in the side content taking place in the Deadfire Archipelago, which also takes on a bit of a pirate theme, which, again, wasn't everybody's cup of tea. In basically every other way, Deadfire is a superior game, in my opinion, to the first one, which obviously isn't something everyone will agree with, though that is my opinion. This is largely because most of the systems that were present in the first game were expanded upon in a way that makes it easier to play, which includes things like the ability to multi-class, which gives you tons of combinations, and as you level up, you can actually open up a sort of tree for your abilities to let you see what you'll be able to get when, which allows you to plan a build a little bit easier, on top of systems and set pieces that just make it a much more interesting game. But again, pretty heavy on the text, has that pirate theme, and the main story is relatively short. Then we have Obsidian's lesser known CRPG, which is Tyranny, which is a bit of a one-off that released in between Pillars 1 and Pillars 2, though is honestly one of my favorite favorite games from Obsidian, as it is very unique as far as CRPGs go, especially the spellcrafting system. But before we get into that, the world of Tyranny is meant to be more of a the bad guys have won situation. An overlord known as Kairos has largely taken over the world, with the game taking place in the last bastion that has not fallen to this person's will. And when you start the game, you are on the bad guy's side, actually. And how you navigate that is ultimately up to you, with many of your options being more of a best of a bad situation option. However, there are multiple paths through the title. Personally, I really love this one for the art style, but again, also the spell crafting system, which allows you to make your own spells based on each character's lore, which allows you to customize magical ability to each one of your characters based on their own aptitude. And you can do some really fun stuff by experimenting with this system, and it's a fun game to play if only for just that reason. Now, last up for this section, we have have the ever-present classics of Baldur's Gate 1 and 2. Now, obviously, if you're looking forward to Baldur's Gate 3, yes, I would recommend you play the first two, but that does come with a few caveats. Baldur's Gate 1 and 2 are not particularly difficult games, I would say. The issue is that they are based on a system that not a lot of people are familiar with anymore, which is Advanced Dungeons & Dragons. And outside of the OSR community, you don't really see a lot of releases for that, OSR being Old School Revival, which sees adventures and things printed for older and other systems. However, if you are willing to learn a little bit of Advanced Dungeons & Dragons, Baldur's Gate 1 and 2 become pretty easy. And thankfully, via enhanced editions, despite being very old games as well, they will run on modern hardware with no real effort on your part, which has been the case of all the games up to this point as well. Though both Baldur's Gate 1 and 2 tell you the story of the Baldspawn, and yes, I am about to spoil this because it is a 20 plus year old game, though most mostly just the first one, as the second one this information is already present. But we play as the child of the god of murder, and we have to decide how that is going to define our character and what we potentially do about it. 
And while these games are certainly showing their age, in many respects they still hold up, which is why you find so many people that love these games, with many people considering Baldur's Gate 2 in particular one of the best games ever made. Now it is worth mentioning a few things here though, the enhanced editions did add a little bit of content to the game as well that some people didn't like as it doesn't exactly match the tone of a lot of the other stuff. And then there is, again, just the age of the games themselves. They are certainly not spring chickens, which means many of the systems at play are clunky, much of the advanced Dungeons and Dragons system just isn't explained here, which means you're going to have to get information from outside sources if you want to actually learn it without struggling. And by the way, I've made a pretty long video that does just that. Though, all that said, while I wouldn't really recommend these games right out of the gate unless you're already familiar with that system, once you have a basic understanding of the genre and things, I would tell you to check these games out as they are well loved for a pretty good reason, that reason being that they're great games. Even if they are accompanied by a relatively high high barrier to entry these days for people who are not familiar with those systems. That though does finally bring us to our next section of the video, which is some fantastic recent indie CRPGs. These are RPGs that are smaller in scope. If anything, they are a little less polished than many of the titles we've mentioned up to this point, as they are indie games, and you do not see a lot of indie CRPGs. More often than not, they are double A. And this is because CRPGs are pretty complicated. However, they also lack mass appeal, which is why you don't exactly see a lot of AAA CRPGs either. They tend to fall right in that middle area. So while these games I would very much so consider indie, do keep in mind that the quality here is probably a little bit less than the other games on this list as a result, but they are still pretty fun. First and foremost, we have Encased, which is one of many games that was heavily inspired by Fallout that sees us under a dome, which houses ancient technology that ultimately traps people who go into the dome under it, because while people can pass into it, they cannot leave without dying. And after a sort of cataclysmic event in the dome, you're left in a sort of post-apocalyptic situation that involves a lot of science fiction. And that relatively interesting premise, alongside things like a variety of role-playing options and many ways to build your character, that include what wing of the organization that hired you to go into the dome you are from, which can sort of set some of your initial starting stats or potentially give you extra dialogue options just by itself, alongside a very flexible main story that can can be broken and beaten just about every which way you can think of, makes for a game that you can get a lot of fun out of, especially if you like games like Fallout or just science fiction in general. However, this game is a little bit clunky in the execution of those things down to the animations as well as things like the voice acting being a little bit rough, but it's not overly complicated and can be a very fun one to get into. Then we have Atom RPG, another sort of Fallout-like, however this one aims to be much more of a modern version of the original two Fallouts down to things like the inventory. This game sees you traversing a post-apocalyptic USSR as you try to solve a mystery of sorts, a mystery that can be solved a variety of ways, again this one's pretty freeform, where beating the game really only requires you to go to a specific place and once you know where that is and how to do it, you can get there pretty quickly. So because of that, the main story can be broken and changed quite freely depending on your exact approach to things, with the main drawbacks for this one being that it's a very janky indie experience. Of all the games on this list, this one is noticeably a bit more janky than the others I would say, however if you're familiar with the original Fallouts 1 and 2, you should feel relatively right at home here. With my only real complaint being that a lot of the builds in particular are frustrating, especially very early in the game, where just trying to get a decent hit chance to not die repeatedly is probably the biggest problem the game has. However, if you're willing to look past that, there's a great experience to be had there, hidden underneath a wealth of janky mechanics. Last for this particular section, we have a recent entry with Black Geyser, which was heavily inspired by the first Baldur's Gate, though Black Geyser has a few unique mechanics. Mainly the world's greed level, as you go around adventuring, taking part in various quests, or how you complete them I should say, that is to say demanding money or foregoing rewards, all affects the world's greed level. As this reaches certain milestones, the world will change and react to things differently, which can lead to some interesting changes. When this game launched, it felt a little bit undercooked, even if it was a pretty fun experience. However, 
However, with several updates since then, they've really fleshed a lot of stuff out, and it's a much better experience overall. And this particular game has built an especially interesting world, as well as mechanics to play around with, with my main drawback being that the combat in particular is a little underwhelming, which is a place indie games in particular can really struggle with. Though, again, a bit of a diamond in the rough for me, even if it does have some problems. Overall, I did really enjoy Black Geyser, and if you're looking for more diverse, I would say, CRPGs to check out, this is a great one. That, though, brings us to our next section, and these are a few games that will provide you a bit of challenge. While they are definitely fantastic games, in my opinion, they aren't really places I would recommend most people start, if only because they can either be pretty difficult or just very systems dense, which is the case for both Pathfinder Kingmaker and Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous. Wrath of the Righteous is one of my personal favorite games, period, but the problem with both Pathfinder titles is that they are incredibly systems dense. Pathfinder 1E, which is the system they are based on, has a lot going on. If you're familiar with D&D 3.5, you might be okay, but simply put, there is a lot to know, which makes getting into those games a little bit difficult, although a variety of difficulty options will help you out here. Of the two, I would say Kingmaker is the one to really watch out for because many of the kingdom management settings can make the game much more frustrating than you might want it to be. However, even that has difficulty options. So if you really want to play these two, you definitely can, but I would tweak the difficulty options until you get comfortable playing the game. Of the two, Wrath of the Righteous is a little bit easier, simply because you have more options to play with. However, in order to understand and use those options effectively, you have to know even more about the Pathfinder system, and more specifically, how some of it was implemented in this game even, which is also something I've made a bunch of guides on. My new player guide for Wrath of the Righteous is like two hours long though, which means the barrier to entry for someone who is just sort of passively interested is pretty high. So needless to say, these ones are a bit more of a time investment than the previous titles, which is also the case for Underrail. Another fantastic CRPG, but Underrail is known for its difficulty. It's known for being a hard game. And while I would say that's not quite as extreme as people make it out to be, the most important thing to understand about Underrail is that the game will let you fail. It will let you make wrong decisions and fail because of those decisions, oftentimes with the only real solution being just starting over. And that's not exactly everybody's cup of tea. However, if you're fine with that, then Under Rail is a fantastic game with an especially interesting world and a story that also goes some pretty weird places towards the end as well. Basically, civilization is living down underground in a series of almost metro tunnels reminiscent somewhat of Metro Exodus, but how you navigate all the different factions and mutated beings living down here and what you do about those is largely up to you, and with a large variety of builds to play in Metro around with, it's certainly a game you can have some fun with if you're willing to get past that sort of difficulty curve the game has, as it doesn't have quite as many options for adjusting that as many of the other titles here do. So if you're looking for a challenge or you want to engage with something a bit more in-depth, those games might be for you. To wrap this video up, I thought we'd talk about a few third-person CRPGs. As a note here at the beginning of this section, third-person CRPGs are few and far between in terms of modern games. There are a significant amount of older ones, usually around the late 2000s, early 2010s. However, these days, 3D, if you will... CRPGs are pretty rare. Most games tend to go the more open-world action RPG route, and when they do include RPG mechanics, it's often things like damage numbers that don't make a ton of sense, as there's a bit of mental dissonance between what you're seeing and the way it's working in the background, which is why you don't exactly see a lot of CRPGs in this genre anymore. But nonetheless, here's a couple if you'd like to try them out. First and foremost, we have Dragon Age Origins, and while I don't honestly enjoy this as much as everyone else, Else really does, it is still a very good game, and if you're looking for a great entry point into CRPGs, Dragon Age Origins will do that very well for you, and honestly the lore of Dragon Age is fantastic and worth getting into if only just for that. However, problems you might run into here are that it does not necessarily like modern hardware. You might have a problem, you might not, I've seen very conflicting reports about it. Personally, I had a ton of issues trying to run this game 
but there are some mods and things like that you can find that will address that, but do know you might have some problems running this one. Then we have Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines, another one of my personal favorites, but the vanilla version is not fun. You'll almost definitely want to download the unofficial patch, a version of which comes with the GOG version of this game, though it is not the most recent version, so you might want to update that anyway. However, with the unofficial patch, Bloodlines is a wonderful game, a unique experience as far as these games go that I think honestly just about everybody should play. I've played it backwards and forwards. Essentially, we play as one of several vampire clans and we are freshly turned, mostly just trying to survive, which then leads into a broader narrative about the antediluvians, which is a big focus of Vampire the Masquerade, which is a tabletop game. While Bloodlines might be old, even to this day, it has a wonderful charm to it, and if you are looking for something a little different to play, definitely check out Bloodlines. Because while it is certainly aging and has plenty of, say, clunky combat, if you're looking to get into games like this, it's a must play. Though when it comes to these types of games, I would be remiss not to mention Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, both 1 and 2, which each have their pros and cons, with these games also seeing various mods, etc. to make them more playable on modern hardware, which you again may or may not have an issue with here. But while the KOTOR games are certainly getting up there in age, they are nonetheless really fantastic games, and while the remake for KOTOR is very much so up in the air at this point, we don't know if that's going to wind up getting cancelled, it's probably not worth waiting on anymore, so if you're looking to jump into the Star Wars franchise as far as CRPGs go, with games that are based on D&D 3.5, KOTOR is a great place to do that, and these games have some pretty wonderful writing, the second one in particular. So if you're not a fan of Isometric, there are a few other options for you, but they are getting further and far between, with more modern iterations being almost non-existent. Even after that, there are plenty of other examples, which brings us to the closing of this video. While I have talked about a great many games in this video, I have really only scratched the surface of what CRPGs have to offer. I have played and reviewed many, many games more than this, but a lot of these games I think are great places to start for people people who are just getting into the genre. However, as I mentioned at the very beginning of the video, the best place to start is whatever looks the best to you, because that is what is going to keep you interested and get you past those learning curves. So if you have any games that you loved, or if you're a veteran who has some suggestions yourself, by all means, drop them down in the comment section below. The more the merrier. I am hardly an authority on this, even with all my experience. However, hopefully this will be enough to sort of get your foot in the door get you to playing more of these games, which means you can have more conversations with me and others all about them, which is, quite frankly, one of my favorite subjects, if you couldn't tell by this whole YouTube channel. So, with all of that said, I sincerely hope this video helped you in some way, answered some questions you might have. I'm hoping it's relatively comprehensive on this subject, and given the relatively slow releases of true CRPGs these days, this is likely to stay pretty relevant for a while, with a few upcoming additions obviously being in the mix, such as Baldur's Gate 3, or of course, Warhammer 40k Rogue Trader, all of which I will certainly be covering. In the meantime, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, like, comment, subscribe, all that YouTube jazz, but regardless of any of that, truly, just thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. May you wander in wisdom, and have an amazing day.